Now I request the panel members, uh, Dr. Rabindranath uh, Mehrotra, sir. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. So we'll move on uh, with the next session, uh, essentially a little panel discussion on uh, what we can learn more in diabetes. I would uh, like to um, invite our uh, chairpersons uh, for this panel discussion up on the stage, please. Uh, Professor Dr. P. V. Rao, sir. Um, Sir is uh, the former senior professor in HOD Department of Endocrinology and Metabolism at NIMS. Welcome, sir. A pleasure to have you. I'd like to call upon Dr. Rakesh Kumar, sir. Um, sir uh, is the professor of endocrinology at Osmania Medical College. Uh, and um, Sahai's Endocrine and Diabetes Center in Hyderabad. Welcome, sir. I'd like to call upon Dr. Meher Prasad, sir. Uh, welcome, sir. Sir is a senior consultant, uh, diabetes, endocrine, obesity at Idea Clinics and at Chednad Hospital, Kaveri Hospital. Um, welcome, everyone. So uh, without uh, further ado, I'd like to move on uh, with the session. Um, can I have the slides up on, please? Thank you. Um, so uh, a few topics of interest. Um, I thought uh, this would be something we'd all like to learn from our experts. And so it's going to be a more of uh, like, you know, question answer session. So, um, you know, we all understand that I think over the years, um, understanding, learning more about diabetes and pathophysiology that, you know, our patients present to us, um, you know, with different clinical presentations um, and uh, disease uh, progression stages. So um, we've understood not one size fits all. And uh, to move beyond just talking about, you know, or categorizing our patients at type 1 and type 2 diabetes. So more recently, we've uh, understood that um, Diabetes could be a heterogeneous disease with patients uh, experiencing, um, you know, various contributions from a mixture of like, say, beta cell dysfunction, uh, defective insulin secretion and insulin action. So um, uh, very recently, there was um, a Swedish uh, study like the Anders cohort, which kind of helped um, you know, identify diabetes subgroups beyond just talking about type 1 and type 2 diabetes. <laughs> which may help risk stratify uh, these patients, optimize or direct uh, further treatment strategies. So this was the study which came out in 2018 and essentially based on six clinical parameters, um, um, you know, uh, s uh, five subgroups of diabetes were identified as uh, severe autoimmune diabetes, uh, severe insulin deficient um, uh, diabetes, severe insulin resistance diabetes, mild obesity related diabetes and mild uh, age related diabetes. You know, it was uh, seen in this cohort that, you know, say for example, those with the severe insulin resistance diabetes, that uh, this group uh, tended to show, um, you know, a more uh, incidence or uh, risk of progression towards CKD, um, NFLD was more prevalent. Uh, those with the mild obesity related and mild age related diabetes tended to have a better prognosis. So, um, you know, the question really is, um, you know, these uh, different clusters, they behaved differently. They had different phenotypic, uh, phenotypic characteristics, uh, diabetic complication trajectories. So are we moving towards, you know, defining a more precision medicine approach in diabetes care? So uh, my first question is to Professor Rakesh Sahai, sir. Um, you know, keeping the study in context, um, you know, how do you... Uh, see um, this being utilized in our Indian context. Um, what is your clinical experience, sir? Yeah, so I think uh, <clears throat> as you've highlighted the fact that type 2 diabetes, although, you know, you, we know that the type 2 diabetes is more because of uh, insulin resistance and insulin deficiency being necessarily there. But uh, we see that uh, there are different uh, individual, I mean, different phenotypes of that. It's not a a hetero, I mean, homogeneous disease, there's a lot of heterogeneity with, you know, some at very high risk of complications, some others who do not 
maintain very good glycemic control, but still escape from complications. So we always had this uh, this thing as to, you know, how do you uh, un identify people who are at greater risk of complications? Because we need to be more aggressive in them in terms of preventing the complications. Because we have a lot of data from all the uh, studies uh, which show that good glycemic control and and management of all the other comorbidities is going to prevent the complication. So I think towards that end, this uh, this study has uh, actually given us thoughts about doing this and we have two other studies from India which have looked at that, uh, uh, looked at the data from the ICMR and DIAB data has been uh, looked at and, and also the data from Dr. Mohan has, uh, uh, you know, looked at his data and his, uh, and they've looked at uh, whether this uh, sort of uh, subclasses exist in our population and they have suggested that there they are uh, indeed uh, sim some similarities but some differences in terms of uh, having a, a subtype which has got a both severe ins combined insulin resistance and deficiency they have, they have identified that group and uh, and that group is at a very high risk of uh, uh, of both the renal and retinal complications and so th that is something which is different from what we see in the western population so if that actually uh, is the group which we see very commonly we see a lot of lean diabetics who have uh, quite uh, significant hyperglycemia who are very difficult to manage and uh, they are the, they are probably the ones who fit into that group which has severe insulin resistance and insulin deficiency and the some of the groups which have are similar are the ones like the the mild age related diabetes which also is seen in our population and th those are but seen at a lower age their average a age was about 50s and 60s whereas you know in the other swedish study it was uh, at least a decade high uh, age right. was a little more in that group also so those that group uh, remains again like a little uh, indolent group which doesn't have a very high risk of complications, so we probably don't need to be too aggressive in them and we need to be a little less aggressive, focus our attention more on this group which has got a higher risk of complications. So I think we are indeed moving towards precision medicine, we are looking at these parameters, uh, um, understanding, I mean, dividing our, I mean, or class, classifying or clustering our patients into these different clusters and, and uh, doing it, uh, although we are looking for, you know, better uh, sort of Cl clustering tools, which may uh, we 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 do it sort of, uh, you know, looking at these characteristics. Uh, we o often use these uh, characteristics to understand how to uh, stratify our patients. That's great, sir. I think uh, future holds a lot for us in store. But building up on the same, Professor P. V. Rao, sir. So, do you see any uh, benefit in then uh, checking for like, you know? indices like HOMA IR or uh, checking for beta cell function? So I will uh, start my uh, discussion with the history of uh, HOMA. Sometime around 1983-85 they have introduced this HOMA. Those days it was very simple, just blood glucose and uh, millimoles into insulin, micro units divided by 22.5 over. So we were very curious how did they come to such a simple equation for uh, IR. Those are the days when there were no computers and uh, only Apple computer was there. So we were very curious to know. So I, I'm not from uh, Oxford, but uh, we have visited Oxford to know the statistics part of it. But since then they have been uh, revising it. They have made it log conversion, standardization, so much of uh, Thing now it is not possible for anybody to manually calculate HOMA IR or HOMA IS or HOMA BF. Even beta cell function was so simple in those days. Blood sugar, blood glucose, uh, millimoles into insulin, uh, sorry, blood glucose minus uh, 20 into insulin divided by blood glucose minus 3.5. It's very simple. But now it has become so complicated, we have to use the Excel sheet or you have to use the uh, pull down menu. So it is not possible for uh, people in the clinics to go by HOMA IR or HOMA yes, like what they are describing in uh, this cluster classification based on a small group in uh, Scania from uh, Sweden. Uh, so Mohan has sort of uh, revised it uh, as an uh, inspired study. So uh, India, Scotland participation uh, for precision medicine. So he has uh, sort of uh, removed the GAD antibodies. Mm -hmm. GAD antibodies is not being routinely done in uh, India, so that's why they removed GAD. And instead of calculating... Added lipids. Added lipids. And instead of uh, 
uh, doing this Homa, he said uh, one fasting uh, C peptide should be okay because we can use C peptide and calculate Homa here. Similarly, without doing any calculations, without going for uh, higher statistics, we can just take C peptide, fasting C peptide. And uh, he has uh, made in inspired is only four groups, not five groups. So it is uh, insulin deficiency, insulin resistance, plus combined insulin, ins uh, insulin uh, deficiency and resistance. Like that, uh, yes, related. So they have made it sort of a simple classification. But in my opinion, uh, it's not possible for people to calculate HOMA IR and HOMA IS. Yes, but I want to uh, tell one, ins one, one example of how this is being done in smaller clinics. One small, it's only example I'm just giving. It's not routinely being practiced because we have developed a point of care device for C peptide where you can do C peptide test within 20 minutes. So with our point of care device, now it is now no more uh, popular, but at one time we were doing it in filter paper, dried blood spots and uh, point of care devices. So point of care device in capillary blood, C peptide, was used even in a small place like Khammam for his own uh, satisfaction or for his own explanation. So HOMA IR, HOMA IS and HOMA BF was written on the case, in the case sheet, in the prescription pad of uh, one doctor in uh, Khammam, he's a, a world practitioner. So he based on C-peptide and fasting glucose. And then he was telling, he was actually using that particular uh, prescription pad to show his patients that with the pioglitazone, with metformin, SGL2 has also been introduced with all these uh, things that they, they are not, we don't consider them as a, uh, strong insulin sensitizers, but he was showing some benefit in IR by taking C-peptide fasting with our point of care device and glucose. So like that, people have been experimenting a lot with uh, IR, uh, but it is not possible. We do a lot of CLAMP studies. So even, even now, Mostly clamp studies are being done by gastroenterology people now. So there is going to be a huge uh, phenomics research coming up. Phenomics research. You no know more genomics and uh, proteomics. It is going to be phenomics research. So huge phenomics research taking into account some thousand parameters. So that uh, study is uh, coming up in, uh, uh, by Asian Institute of Gastroenterology. So, but they will not use this HOMA IR and HOMA IS or HOMA to BF and all these things. They go by CLAMP studies. It's a very difficult studies. That's why these are all for research purposes, but I don't think we'll be able to use this HOMA IR, HOMA IS, HOMA BF for cluster class. Sure, sir. No, um, that's very insightful, sir. You're right. Uh, I think it's going to take um, some thinking about it. Uh, Dr. Meher Prasad, sir, so, you know, um, Again, uh, if we talk about patients with, say, severe insulin deficiency, severe insulin resistance, obesity-related, so, um, you know, how does it help you identify, like, you know, okay, which drug would benefit the other patient more, say, compared to the other? So is there any therapeutic implication of um, also, like, you know, categorizing our patients uh, into these subcategories? Um. Well, uh, I mean, as, uh, um, as you alluded, uh, the, the, the diabetes management is becoming more and more uh, precision diagnosed. It's more uh, aimed at uh, specific subgroups and the specific agents. Um, so uh, it, it does, these things does help, but it will take some time. Uh, sure, and also uh, more of more genetic studies coming, right. uh, in both in type 1 and also in type 2, type 1 also. Uh, it is going in that direction, sure. and it's becoming going to become more and more uh, useful. The studies and also the investigations in uh, tailoring it to individual individual patients. That's right, sir. Th thank you, thank you so much, sir. So, um, moving on to the next um, topic. So, um, something I think uh, very uh, commonly seen in our day-to-day -day practice topic. Uh, I think a hotly debated topic as well, uh, metformin use in pregnancy. So over the years, of course, we've realized that, you know, um, uh, the, the prevalence of, of course, GDM is there. You know, it's pretty high in our Indian population. And I think for the ease of uh, using metformin, um, 
um, you know, we've uh, read multiple surveys, read multiple studies, you know, there are, mul you know, many doctors who are comfortable using metformin in pregnancy in GDM patients. So we do have, um, you know, data to support uh, maternal safety for uh, metformin, um, you know, less uh, chances of weight gain uh, for obese patients and uh, less chances of hypoglycemia. Then um, we talk about short-term benefits with uh, um, you know, lesser incidence of large for gestational age, age babies, uh, less hypoglycemia. Um, but, you know, of late, you know, a lot of um, research and data is coming about, you know, talking about adverse fetal programming with uh, this drug and a higher incidence of, um, you know, childhood obesity uh, in kids born to mothers um, using metformin um, uh, for GDM. So, um, essentially, uh, when we look at uh, the guidelines across the world, um, you know, uh, most of the guidelines actually endorse insulin as the first-line treatment for GDM, and uh, uh, usually metformin is reserved as like uh, the category B or the second-line drug. It crosses the placenta. There are these concerns. Um, so I wanted to know from experts here, what do they think about metformin use? So first question for um, um, Meher Prasad, sir. Um, what is uh, your experience uh, using metformin uh, in pregnancy? Um, well, I, uh, my experience, uh, in my experience, we, I do use metformin quite a lot in pregnancy in Asian patients. Um, and also people who have been on it, uh, either because of uh, PCOD or uh, uh, obesity, we, I do continue with, uh, that. Uh, with metformin and also insulin uh, as, nece I mean, uh, as necessary. Um, so I do continue uh, and also initiations, um, I maybe wait till the first trimester is over and then uh, I do quite use quite a lot in, in Asian patients. Okay. Um, so and then uh, obviously insulin will be the uh, drug of choice and uh, so that, that's how I use it. Okay. Um, Rakesh, sir, um, what um, what do you think about the use of metformin, and how do you see, say, the guidelines uh, changing or not changing? In yeah, your so I think um, if you look at all the guidelines today, also all of them speak of of uh, insulin as the first choice, right. and uh, you know metformin comes in as a close second choice because of the ease of use and the fact that you know the studies done till now have not shown any adverse impact. I mean, the, because it freely crosses the placenta, we all know that it freely crosses the placenta and uh, but since there is no data on any adverse fetal or maternal outcomes, uh, so uh, uh, because of that it has been uh, sort of uh, uh, recommended for use, particularly if you look at the Indian guidelines also, you have not uh, mentioned this on the table, on this table, the Ministry of Health of India, Government of India has also suggested the use of uh, metformin in the second and ter third trimesters. They have uh, in fact put it equivalent to insulin in the second and third trimesters, uh, whereas they still haven't spoken about the first trimester use of uh, metformin.